Ephesians chapter 3, let's begin in verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is that what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you that we have the privilege of being able to study your word together Lord, you say that you exalt your word even above your own name. And Jesus, we recognize that you said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So Lord, we just pray that you would use these verses for your purposes in our lives. We yield to you and we thank you for the privilege of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we continue this series. We're in week three. And we've looked at uh, Paul's prayers related to being thankful for the gifts of the Spirit. We've seen Paul thank the Lord and pray related to um, uh, the God of all comfort comforting us. And this week we're going to be thankful for God's power in the inner man. And what exactly is the inner man? The inner man is the eternal part of us, the immaterial part of us. Sometimes it's referred to as the spirit man. It's our soul and our spirit. Imagine you drive in a car, and at one point you, it breaks down, and you have to get out and start walking. That's kind of a good illustration to, comp- to describe what we experience, because we are a spirit who possesses a body. And one day we're going to lay this tent down, this body down, and God's going to give us an, a new body. We're going to go from having a pinto. Hope nobody has a pinto here right now. Are there any pintos out there? I stole my aunt's pinto when I was 12 and went for a joy ride around my neighborhood. And I could barely, I hear the uh oh, uh, I could barely see over the steering wheel, you know. And I did it twice. I didn't learn my lesson the first time. I did it twice, and sadly, I didn't get caught. But that was the first car that I ever drove was a Pinto. So if you have a Pinto or had one, I can totally relate. But he, we traded in our Pinto for like whatever the ultimate car would be, a Lamborghini or whatever. For me, it would be a 1968 Mustang Shelby, um, you know, in, in all its glory, with a 428 I can get more specific if you want. Uh, I don't know what it is about pastors of Calvary Chapel, Half Moon Bay, love cars and love classic cars. It must be a requirement or something because uh, both the previous pastor, Pastor Brian and myself, really love cars. I don't know how I got on that, but you get the idea. So our inner man, our inner man's eternal. um, And so before we come to know Christ, it's important for us to understand that we're spiritually dead. In the previous chapter, in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul wrote this in verses 1 through 5, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, I love that, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. So Paul has already told them, that they were spiritually dead, but God supernaturally made them alive. The only one that can make us spiritually alive is the Lord Jesus. And he does it by his Holy Spirit. And it's based on righteousness. 
And so since we don't have a righteousness of our own, God imputes a righteousness to us and saves us by his grace, not because we earn it. And then he puts his Holy Spirit inside of us who regenerates us and makes our dead spirit alive. And, and that's what mechanically what happens inside of us at the moment of salvation. And, and, and they call it regeneration. When he takes our dead spirit and he makes us alive. So our inner man is alive and communes and communicates with God. And what a blessing that is to be able to have that kind of relationship with the living Lord of the universe. It's just some, you know, we get so used to how things are in terms of Christianity, and we sometimes get so used to these amazing truths and these amazing realities that we actually have the God of the universe who's outside of time, who created everything out of nothing. We have him inside of our bodies. A lot, and that's beautiful that to him that he can come inside of us and have that relationship with us. So Paul's going to pray for the believers in Ephesus some amazing things. And what's great about seeing Paul pray all the prayers that he prays for the different churches, if you do a study, there's quite a bit of them. There's a lot of them. You get to really see God's heart for his people because God's the one that inspired Paul to write what he wrote and to pray what he prayed. So uh, for us, it's important for us to be thankful. And that's why this is included in our Thanksgiving series here is because God's always wanting to continue to work in us to where he develops a thankful heart in us because we're supposed to be thankful in all things, we're told in scripture. Not thankful for all things, but thankful in our th all things, because God is sovereign. He works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Because the next verse in Romans 8, 29 says to, that he wants to use those things to further conform us into the image of Christ. So there's always purpose in what God allows in our lives, every single thing. And that's why we can pause at any moment in time when we're going through something difficult and thank God in those things. Because so often he doesn't deliver us from things. We talked about it last week. He delivers us through things. And, it's, and that's how maturity comes in part is by walking through difficulty. We always want to shield ourselves from all possible difficulty as much as we can and insulate ourselves. And with our prosperity, to some extent, we can do that. We can insulate ourselves against so much of what the rest of the world has to constantly deal with constantly believe God for food, constantly believe God for shelter. And we live so far above the rest of this world. And sometimes we can get so familiar with that and so used to that, we don't have a thankful heart. But God wants us to have a thankful heart. He loves that. Now he begins in verse 14. Look with me there. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he bows his knees to God, the father, and, and, you know, that is actually a common posture related to prayer is, and you see it all through the scripture, we're praying on our knees. It's a posture of dependence. Sometimes people ask me how, you know, like, what's the, how should I, when I'm in prayer, what should I be doing? Lying face first, or, you know, on my knee, like however the Lord leads you, um, it, it, it's the most important thing. The most important thing is that we pray. It doesn't really matter the posture you know, but because it, it doesn't like get God to listen more or earn brownie points to them or whatever. It's just expressing our heart that we're dependent upon him and we're submitted to him. But he says, notice he, that he says, for this reason. So he's going to express that he's praying for them certain things, but he says, this reason I, I, I'm, I bow my knees and pray for them. And the, the reason is actually in the previous verse. Look at verse 13. It says, therefore, I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul doesn't want them to lose heart because he is suffering. And he's in prison right now. It's one of the prison epistles. He's in prison. And what's beautiful is that he's already had jail breaks. He's, God's already broken him out of jail. Uh, and so he knows that God can do that in a second. And that's why he refers so often that, he, that he's a prisoner of Christ not a prisoner of Rome, but a prisoner of Christ, because God is sovereign over us when we're in prison. I've never been in prison. I'm hopefully that I don't do that someday. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, but 
the point is, is that he knows that God is sovereign over that. So he doesn't want them to lose heart. Now he adds in verse 15, from whom the whole body in heaven and earth is named. Now I notice, first of all, he says that we're a family. We talk about that a lot. We talk about the fact that we're one family here locally, but also the broader family, the body of Christ. And there's the what's been described as the big C church and the small C, lowercase church. This is the lowercase church, um, that we're all one family, one body here, and we're primarily a body who secondarily, as I've mentioned before, are individual members. But we are a family. But then there's the big C church, which is the body of Christ in general, which which transcends the denomination. Right? It, it's God knows those who are His, and that could be in any church, and even churches that are not biblical churches. There can be people in there that erroneously believe Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins, and they're in that church. That doesn't validate the doctrine of that church. It just shows that God, whoever God honors faith, and whoever trusts in Him and repents, He honors that and saves them. But he says, from whom, talking about the Father, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So we get our, we get our identity uh, through the Father there. And God loves the fact that he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Nobody is more thankful that we're saved than God himself. Because God went through so much to be able to provide for us salvation and to offer it as a free gift that's the only way we could have salvation is by doing it through grace now paul gets to his requests here he's going to make four requests basically there's some other aspects to it you could maybe argue that it's more than just four but but the there there are four main requests here and again we need to remember that the holy spirit is inspiring paul to write to, to pray and to record these requests for not for the for the church of Corinth to see and read and be blessed by, but also for posterity to read and be blessed by, and to encourage us uh, in these things because the things he prays for is God's will for us today. Sometimes people wonder, what's God's will for my life? Well, there's there's times where he says it in the scripture so clearly. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, and those are really amazing. But the things that we see Paul pray for, God is trying to encourage us that this is God's will. This is what God wants for you. This is why I inspired Paul to pray these things and to record it. It's amazing to be so blessed by God. We go around being blessed all the all day long, and, and sometimes we forget just how much God has lavished upon us his spiritual blessings. Ephesians chapter 1, two chapters earlier, He goes over this long run-on sentence, this long list of blessings and inheritance in Christ Jesus. And it's like, even just like a one or two verses in, you're exhausted, just going, man, I just can't take anymore. What do you get some, what do you get some people that have, you know, usually we say, what do you get someone that has everything? But this is more like, what do you get somebody that has nothing and that you love them? You, You give them all the things that God has given us. And we're going to be exploring those things and learning about our inheritance in Christ for all eternity. We're, f- we're told in Ephesians chapter 2, the previous chapter in verse 7, that in the ages to come, that's really, literally in the eons to come, he will, we'll be learning about the riches of his grace. We'll have a new body. We'll, we're not going to have a flesh. We're not going to have a sinful nature. But we're still going to be growing. It'd be boring to just get our new bodies and be maxed out with the most growth that we could ever possibly have. That would be boring. I want to be growing. Even in eternity, I want to be growing. And because Jesus is limited or unlimited and God is unlimited, there's going to be an unlimited of grace that he's going to um, bestow upon us while we're with him in heaven. So he has withheld nothing good from us at all whatsoever. And so he gets to these and he says, the first request is to be strengthened in the inner man. Verse 16 says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Notice he says grant you, that he would grant you. It's something that we don't earn. It's something that he just bestows upon us, that he would grant us that. And he says, according to his riches in glory and by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent through whom he ministers to us. And because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. But he says, 
that, that, that we would be strengthened with might in the inner man. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit to us is to strengthen our spirits with his power. It's the Greek word dunamis. Some people say we get our word dynamite from it, power. And, and he gives us power to live a different kind of life. One of the most frustrating things for new believers often is their frustration that they can't be holy like they want to be in their own strength. They keep trying and failing, trying and failing, trying and failing. That's why Jesus refers to the abundant Christian life. He talks about fruit coming forth because trees don't have to strive to have fruit produced. That happens automatically, naturally, so to speak, because of their identity and because they're tapped into the root system and they're fertilized and, and all these things. That's how fruit is produced. So he contrasts works of the flesh with fruit of the spirit. So that way, that, that's how we can um, bear fruit. And he wants to bear fruit through us. And fruit, just like spiritual fruit, is just like physical fruit. The main beneficiary of that fruit is not the tree. Sometimes we can read that list, the fruit of the spirit, and we can Think about it in terms of how we will enjoy God producing those things in our lives. And we do enjoy them. I remember when I was a new Christian, I was shocked that all of a sudden these things started coming out of my life. It was like, how is this happening? This isn't me. This is changing me from the inside out. He's just producing this through my life. So our spirits commune with God, and we are empowered to hear his voice, to discern his will, to understand his word, to have his mind, to use his gifts, to share his truth, to preach his gospel, and to enjoy his peace. The Spirit fortifies and strengthens our inner man for all these things. And it's God's will that he does that. It's God's will that we're strengthened by his might and fortified and empowered in our inner man. What a huge blessing it is to be able to have him strengthen us on the inside. How many of you are thankful for that today? I am thankful for that today. And you know, the things that were, were told in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, you know, the apostles' doctrine, prayer, breaking of bread, fellowship, all those things, that's why the Holy Spirit wrote, inspired Luke to write that they continued steadfastly in those things. Why did he tell them that? Why did he even tell Luke to write that down? And then why were they con continuously in, engaged in those things? Because those are the things that feed the inner man. You know, a lot of times with new believers, I'll go over the, the whole story of the Indian chief. I don't know if it's true or not. That got saved and they asked him, what's it like being a Christian? And he said, it's like two dogs fighting inside of me, a good dog and a bad dog. And, he, and they asked him, which one is winning? And he goes, whichever one I feed the most. See, because we're born with the bad dog. We're born with the sinful nature. I love sharing with unbelievers that they didn't have to teach their kids how to sin. And that's one of the ways that I try to show them that sin comes naturally. We don't have to educate anybody because we're born in that condition. But then in a moment in time when we repent, when we do a U-turn in the road of life and we trust in Christ alone to pay our way to heaven, put our faith in him, he comes in by his Holy Spirit and regenerates us and makes our dead spirits alive. And then through the Holy Spirit, through his word, through all these things that he's set up, that he lists in Acts chapter 2 that I mentioned, those things build us up and strengthen the inner man. That's what we need. We need to be strengthened in our inner man to be able to live the life that he's called us to live. And then he renews our minds. As a new Christian, I remember battling my thought life so much. It's like, this is just horrible, you know, just battling, battling, battling. But, I, but that got easier over time as my mind was renewed and, and, and God helped me be able to have a, a mind thinking of the things of him and thinking of the things of the Holy Spirit. And, and he, he, he says there that, you know, um, that the Spirit, that, that strengthened with might through his Spirit. So it takes power to strengthen our spirit, and the Holy Spirit has endless power and strength. So we rejoice over that. The second request is for Christ to dwell in your hearts. Look at verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, I just want to pause there, we'll get to the rest of the verse in a second, but he's saying there th that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, they already had the Holy Spirit, so what's he saying this for? How does this, how does this, um, how is this explained? Well, there are two ancient Greek words that convey the idea to live in, 
And one of the ideas is, has to do with a stranger who do, is a temporary guest. And the other is someone that has more of a permanent residence. You know, what's funny is I keep hearing about how Elon Musk is, is staying uh, in Mar-a-Lago and, he, and he's just nonstop there. And, you know, Trump is joking about the fact that he won't go home and, and you know, and... Um, but he's, he's a temporary guest. He's not making his home there as a permanent home. That would be not wise, I would imagine. But the word dwell there, um, the, that's the key to the verse in verse 17, that Christ may dwell. That word has to do with somebody staying and making their home or dwelling permanently. Jesus used this word when he talks about, um, you know, that to abide in me. The word abide means to make our home in or to dwell. That's the same word. And so Jesus wants to settle down and in our hearts and not just visit as a stranger. But that, but that requires something. It requires faith. That's what it says in the middle of the verse, through faith. Do you see that? It requires us to trust in him and to honor him and to allow him to reside in, in us in a way where he's comfortable to, to, uh, to be there. You know, and that's what we want. You know, he was so gracious enough to come inside of us. We should want to make it the best possible experience for him as possible. We want to be hospitable. Just like if someone was staying over your home, you want them to be comfortable. You don't want them to stay there forever, obviously, but you want them to be comfortable and, and to enjoy themselves. So that's the, the key to understanding that. And that's what, what uh, God has called us to, is to trust him and to allow him to live his life in us yielded and that's the key being yielded is the key to the victorious christian life being yielded to him surrendered to him letting him live his life through us i remember one story where someone was walking on the beach and they saw they saw this person painting and it was a beautiful picture of of, of this portrait or whatever and and this person was thinking when they walked up on this painter it's like if i could just have that artist come inside of me, then I'll be able to paint like they could paint. But see, that's what's happened with Christ. He's come inside of us. So he gets to minister. That's one of the things that's easy to forget is that Jesus is still ministering. He's doing it through his church because we're his body. And that imagery is very specific. He wants, he wore his hands and his feet, we're his heart, we're his everything that he want, how he wants to, to minister in this world. He wants us to do it he wants to do it through believers. And so that requires us to be yielded to him, to, to allow him to do what he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. And that can be scary because he doesn't check with me first if I'm going to be comfortable doing something so often when he leads us to do it. You know, like we're at the gas station, we're, we're, we're pumping gas, and he tells us, hey, go to that person over there and give them an invitation card or give them a tract or go tell them that Jesus loves them or whatever it is. And we're hyperventilating while we're getting our gas. We're so nervous. We don't want to do it. Well, well, who told us to do that? We didn't, we, it's not our idea and it's definitely not the enemy's idea. So it, it's got to be the Lord because we wouldn't want to put ourselves out there. And that's the thing in that moment as I'm pumping gas. If I'm open, I'm yielded to him. I'm surrendered to him so that he can work through me as he is, is pleased to do. And he loves to do it. I love that. That's why none of us can take credit for what he does through us, because we know that it's not us doing it, it's him doing it. And it's a beautiful thing when, when someone deflects glory and gives credit to God for what, what's going on in their lives. You know, it's getting more and more popular that athletes will say, I want to first of all thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when they're getting interviewed. And you just see the person interviewing them wince. You know, they just, they can't stand that. And, and they, they still do it. And they give glory to God. And, and God is blessed by that. So um, to be thankful, the fact that we have an inner man, to be thankful that God comes into our lives and changes us and, and he wants to dwell and is willing to dwell in our hearts and make a permanent home in us. What a huge blessing. The third request is to know the love of Christ. Look at the middle of verse 17. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width 
and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So he begins by telling them they've been rooted and grounded in love. The whole basis of our walk, the whole basis of our faith uh, is in Christ is love. That's the foundation of, of, our, of our relationship with God. Jesus has rooted and grounded us in his love because his love was the motivation behind coming to earth to save us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And, and so God's love, that's the foundation. And, and Paul knows the strength of God's love working in his own life. At one point he said, the love of Christ constrains me or compels me. And he talked about, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Jesus said, freely receive, now freely give. God saved the, the apostle Paul when he was on that road to Damascus. And, and he knows that I don't, it's, it would be wrong for me to withhold that from people. I need to share what's happened to me. One of the things you say to a believer when you lead him to Christ is, go tell somebody today. And we could get nervous about that because we're afraid of a bad experience. But if the Holy Spirit truly did a work in them, having someone reject them is not going to throw them off or whatever. It's going to be actually healthy for them to realize. And people are usually shocked how unopen or how closed people are to the gospel once they receive Christ. They feel like everybody's going to instantly receive Christ in their life that they know and they love. And, 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 you know, they get discouraged and they're like, why doesn't everyone see this, what I've seen? And you try to encourage them with, hey, you didn't just get saved the first time I shared with you. It took a long time, right? Well, why do you think it's going to be any different for anybody else? You have to be patient and people are ready when they are ready. So we're rooted and grounded in his love. And it's, it's beautiful that God has demonstrated that love. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us. So I love the fact that he says, and this prayer expresses it. Notice he says, um, to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, or excuse me, verse 18, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints. So he, again, you see these pictures of that we're part of a larger whole primarily through the Bible. And he's saying with all the saints, like all, all united with, with all the saints to understand this incredible love that Jesus has demonstrated for us. And I love that he, he talks about the width and length and depth and height of Christ's love. Isn't it great that Jesus described this through Paul as not one-dimensional love? It's multi-dimensional love. And, and, and he says, his prayer is that God would help them comprehend What's the difference between apprehension and comprehension? Apprehension is you, you grasp the basic concept, but comprehension is understanding it. So he, they already apprehended the truth of that, but God is wanting them to fully comprehend as much as they can being finite, because we can only understand to a point because we're finite, and, but God is infinite. It's like expecting an ant on the ground to fully understand us. So we're so much higher than an ant. There's no way that they could even comprehend us at all. And there's a bigger distance between us and God than there is between an ant and us, because he's infinite. So he, his prayer is that they would comprehend with all the saints, in unity with all the saints, the dimensions of his love. And it says in verse 19 that, the love of Christ surpasses knowledge, surpasses natural knowledge. And that's where he gets to the fourth request, that they may be filled with the fullness of God. What a great thing to pray for somebody, they'd be filled with the fullness of God. Now, God is infinite, so there's no... There's, <laughs> how do you fit an almighty God, an infinite God, into a person? It seems a contradictory, but God, God can come in, God does come inside of us and he does reveal himself. It's talking about the fullness of who God is and his character to be filled with the fullness of God. God wants us to be filled with him to overflowing. 
sometimes when I'm teaching on the baptism with the Holy Spirit, I'll give them a physical example of uh, what it means to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And, and this isn't original, that's why it's good. Um, but, you know, when you get baptized in water, the, one of the first things people do when they come out of the water is they give people a hug. And what happens is they get that water on people. And that's the same way when we're baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon us, and then the, the presence of the Lord and His truth and the effects of all of that overflows our lives onto others, and they get affected as well, much like someone gets water on them when they hug somebody after they've been water baptized. It's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful illustration. And God wants us to be overflowed with His character, all of the fruits of the Spirit. He wants that overflowing through our lives. Um, all of His wisdom, all of His peace, all of His presence, His joy, just to completely overflow us. And He loves to do that. And it's available for us, for, for all of us to be overflowed with, overflowing with the Holy Spirit. It's not how much of the Holy Spirit we have, we have, or possess. It's how much of us does the Holy Spirit have. It's all about being yielded uh, to Him, and that's that's part of what Paul is praying for. It's amazing to think about that we can have as much of the Lord as we want, as much as the Lord as we want. It's just a matter of us deciding to commune with Him and to to, to put an effort towards spending time with Him alone. And there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that intimacy. Because he, he loves to do it. He loves to spend time with us. Now, the thought of all of this just causes Paul to break out in worship. Look at verse 20. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. You know, he's just, well, he's thinking there's, there's, God is limitless. That's what he's thinking. And he's talking about them being filled with the fullness of him and it brings his mind to the fact that there's no limitations on what God can do. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. And I think that that's instructive for us because so often we are not asking him enough for things. We're not bringing things to prayer enough, myself included. We think maybe it's too small of a request or it's not important enough that he's not going to really care. He cares about every single thing that we deal with and everything that's important to us is important to him much like our own children it doesn't matter how small of a thing it is we care about them because it's their little heart that's concerned and we love them and 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 so that's so so too it's with the lord and he puts their focus on how great god is and that's so often the the key to be able to be there for people who are going through hardship is talking about how big of a god we serve how big of a god uh we we have inside of us and, and I love that reminder. It's one of my favorite verses there. Then he says, according to the power that works in us. That's interesting because we sometimes forget that God works powerfully through us, and there's power that's inside of us by the Holy Spirit. So it's funny. He's, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to something that's in us, his power, the Holy Spirit inside of us. And it's, it's a beautiful thing when someone is yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit and they're walking in their own power. That's why Jesus said when he, the day he ascended, he said, don't go anywhere, stay here and seek me and the, the, he'll be, all, be, all, be my witnesses. And he told them to go, not go anywhere because they had all the education they needed. They had ministry experience, but they didn't have power yet. They didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit overflowing their lives. And then in verse 21, he closes, he says, To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Notice it says in the middle of verse 21, in the church. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. This is all about what's inside of us. What's inside of us is priceless. What's inside of us changes us from the inside out. What's inside of us is communicating through our lives as we are yielded to him words that are very meaningful and a blessing to other people. And he knows that. So he's, he's, he, this is how he set things up. So God wants to strengthen the inner man by his power through the spirit abundantly. And I just want to pause here and just 
thank God publicly that he wants to do this in our lives. He wants to, to have us be yielded to him, and he wants to use us and, and work through our lives. It's so amazing to see a Christian that's yielded to the Holy Spirit, and you see power just coming out of their lives. And Jesus said the power wasn't just for power's sake. It, it's for to be a witness to him, to be his witnesses. That requires power. You may remember when the disciples were um, thrown in prison, and they prayed, and, and they, went, they, went, they were let out, and they went and prayed for boldness. And there was an earthquake and everything, and they were, were, they were refilled with the Holy Spirit. There's so often times we forget that God wants to, to refill us. God loves free refills. You know, I remember when, you remember when refills first came, where it was such a, like a scandal of like, they're letting us have as much as we want. Yeah, it costs like a dime for every fill up, you know, and we're going back and back and back and, and make sure when we leave, we're getting a full cup. Like we're just tail, totally taking advantage of, of this amazing uh, truth. You know, it's like, we can't let's make sure we get the maximum amount of soda that we can, or pop. Do you call it pop still? Does anyone call it pop? You're willing to admit that publicly? Whoa, I see that hand. Two hands. Kurt back there in the back. He says pop still. Um, that was not worth the attention that I, I gave to it. But, but the, 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 uh, the point is, is that he, he, more, than we, more than we can go back to infinitely, it seems like, to get refills of our favorite pop, uh, he wants to refill us with the Holy Spirit because we're leaky vessels. That we leak. And, and you see it throughout the book of Acts where somebody is just filled with the Holy Spirit. So how, do, how are we refilled with the Holy Spirit? Refilled by the Holy Spirit by asking. You know, in Luke, it, we're told that he, you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So as we're yielded to him, we can ask to be refilled like they did in that room when they were praying. And God answered that prayer and gave them boldness because there's... You know, and I think as things get worse and worse in our culture, there's going to be more persecution. It's not as, not as relevant as much for us today because we don't have the Roman Empire or the Jews that were religiously jealous coming down on us. I think it would be helpful. I think it would be a great benefit to the church if we had persecution. I say that now, but I'd be in jail probably being the pastor. So, but it's always healthy. Persecution has never been a bad thing for God's people. It's always caused the church to flourish. That's why in China, where it's such strong persecution, there's more Christians than there are in America. You know, and they have less of Scripture than they have everything that it's important. They have less of than we do. Yet they're more fruitful because they it costs something to follow Jesus. The church would look entirely different if it cost us something to follow Jesus. What if it was illegal to come here today? Would you still do it? I hope so. Because I prepare a sermon every week. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, because because, because it's, it's a command. He doesn't say if it's convenient, if it's aligned with the law. He doesn't say any of those things. He just says you got to do these things, and, and he knows there's a price connected to it, and he's okay with that. We can have as much of him as we want. He loves to spend time with us. It's such a huge blessing to him. We forget that it's a blessing to him, but isn't it a blessing to spend time with your kids if you have kids? It's an absolute blessing. I love spending time with my kids. There's never, I'm never maxed out on my kids. Well, I have a history of being maxed out. You know, I wanted a big family originally, <laughs> and then I went through the teenage years, and I realized I'm not made for this. I'm not made for a massive family. And uh, so God knew what he was doing. He knew, he knew my limitations. Sandy could have a big family. She's more patient than I am for sure. But yeah, it was really difficult. So, but God wants to spend time with us. He loves to do it. He, he longs to spend time with us. And he's imploring us over and over again in scripture to take that time to spend time with him. And, and it's amazing that we have a loving God who created everything out of nothing that came himself to die in our place. And that God wants to spend time with me. So, hum so amazing. Um, it's just a huge blessing. I want to close by reading Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 3. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. 
Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. So he just wants us to come. The spirit and the bride say, come. He's always inviting us. He's always knocking on the door. You know, we hear that scripture all the time. I stand at the door and knock, and we use that evangelistically. But really the context is that he's not knocking on the door of an unbeliever's heart. He's knocking on the door of the church, trying to get in because there's all this activity and all these things going on, but he wasn't, he wasn't the one that was focused on. We can't confuse activity with spirit uh, vitality. There's a lot of things that can happen. We could be busy, but it doesn't mean that God's pleased with it. And we could be doing a lot of things for God and forget about our relationship with God. You know, our ministries will never outpace or rise above our personal devotional life. I've heard that since 1995 when I first came to Calvary Chapel in Modesto. And I heard that and it blew me away. And those, those pastors were really strong in saying the whole key to the Christian life is your personal devotions. If you only ate once a week on Sundays, physical food, would you ever expect to be healthy? We never would. But sometimes we see that as how what's appropriate for spiritual sustenance. But Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But yet we, we, we don't prioritize that. What if we read scripture as much as we were on social media or on our phones? Can you imagine the difference it would make in this world? And I'm convicted just talking about it. But it's amazing how these things have implications and he's imploring them, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and you have no money, come. It's not, it's not based on anything that we are bringing to the table. Um, and he's saying, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages on what does not satisfy? And don't we do that? Don't we, uh, you know, so often put priorities on things that are not the most important things that don't help our spiritual growth. We invest in those things but yet we won't invest in our own spiritual fruitfulness. You know, and it's convicting. But he's imploring us to come to him knowing that he is good. You know, the writer of the book of Hebrews <clears throat> said to come boldly into the throne room of grace that we may find grace in our time of need. He's telling us to come boldly. And we'd be happy just to come without boldness, just to come in general. But he's saying, no, come boldly because we are a self-accusatory. We're accusing ourselves and condemning ourselves, and we don't want to come into his throne room in prayer. And he says, come, I know who I'm getting. I know who I, I was getting when I saved you. And I'm telling you to come to me. I'm not dealing with you on the basis of what you deserve. I'm dealing with you on the basis of who I am and my grace that I want to extend towards you. And so that, that's, again, that's part of what I've talked about, about falling towards God, struggling towards God instead of struggling away from God. If, you know, if we struggle and we fall away from the things of the Lord, that we're right where the enemy wants us because he wants us sequestered away, isolated from the body of Christ because it's the body of Christ that gives us strength to be able to grow and to have proper perspective. At one point, David said, you know, I, my heart failed and was failing until I came into the tabernacle or came into the temple. And then I was thinking about the wicked and I realized what their end was. That's why we should never have a steady diet of the news before we've had a steady diet of the word because the word helps us to be able to filter the things that we see in the news properly because we're applying God's word to the, that bad news and it doesn't affect us because we know God's sovereign that all this is going to it to an end towards an end God's sovereign he's in control there's going to be all these things that were is foretold in scripture to happen and they're going to happen and so it, it fortifies us uh, for us to be able to spend that time with him. So God wants us to be strengthened in our inner man. He wants us to be fortified. In our, and what a thing to be thankful for in this season, to think about that he wants to do that. And it's available for us anytime to be strengthened and fortified by his might, through his spirit, to be empowered to uh, be able to commune with him. He wants that communion so badly. And it's just amazing that it, it, it's how it is. It's like, it's way better 
How many of you realize once you started learning and once you started growing as a new believer that this is way better than you thought could ever be possible? Isn't that true? Way better. It keeps getting better. I keep waiting for something that I think up that would be better or, or that he, did, he left out, but I can't. He hasn't. There's nothing that, he, that we can think up that would be better or something that he left out because he's thought of everything. And, and he's just so gracious and loving. It's such a great time to, to think about and be thankful for these things because he wants us to sat, be satisfied. When you, know, when you provide for your children, it means a lot to be able to satisfy them. And, you know, on Thanksgiving especially, you know, we're all overly satisfied. We're bloated. We're like, oh, gosh, oh, I can't move. Help me. Get a crane. <laughs> you know, get me out of this chair. I'm stuck. Uh, I'm not falling. I can't get up. I'm in a chair you know, stuck because I've overeaten. Okay, this is all theory. It wasn't me. It's other people that I've watched. But, you know, but that God wants us to, over, to overflow us and pour into us to where we're like, whoa, I can't take any more. You know, I, I'm so thankful for that communion. And so maybe this might be a word to somebody to prioritize communion with him. And it's good. We can, you know, we can put ourselves back on the throne pretty easy. He wants us to allow him to remain on the throne of our hearts. And then he bears fruit through us so that he'll be glorified. Amen? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this encouragement from the Apostle Paul. Thank you that you led him to write this to the church of Corinth, Lord, and we're thankful that you want to strengthen us in the inner man by your power, by your spirit. We're so thankful, Lord. So help us, Lord, as a church and individually to prioritize communing with you and allowing you to strengthen us in our inner man. We're so grateful that you want to do it. We're so grateful that you're inside of us. We're so grateful that you've changed us from the inside out, those of us that know you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.